I wanted to say some things this morning about what I've learned about things that matter for economic growth uh, in the world, and particularly at the empirical quantitative level, I think we have some answers to that important question from research done since the early 1990s. That research focuses on a lot of different uh, factors that might contribute to economic growth. But for the purpose of this meeting today, I especially wanted to focus on the results that relate to education and also to income inequality. So the framework that I'm going to use to organize these results and to think about the determinants of economic growth uh, is called one of conditional convergence. And the basic idea in this framework is that you can sort out the factors that matter for economic growth into two basic concepts. One having to do with where an economy is at, at a given point in time, such as the current date. And the second having to do with factors that influence where the economy goes in the long run. It's long run target, basically, for the standard of living. So in terms of where an economy is at, there's some force for convergence, which means that if you start off poorer in some sense, measured perhaps by real per capita gross domestic product, that there might be a tendency to grow faster and thereby converge or catch up to the richer places. So that's the convergence force uh, in the model. Now the framework is called conditional convergence because this convergence force has to be conditioned on these other elements or factors that tell you where an economy is going in the long run. And the kinds of things that matter there include the quality of education and health, uh, the quality of legal institutions such as rule of law, property rights, uh, so on. Uh, the tendency to have a higher or low saving rate or to have higher or low fertility rates, uh, macroeconomic stability, maybe even aspects of religion, which is a topic I've been working on more in uh, recent years. But there's an array of these influences about individual characteristics and about government policies and institutions that influence where an economy goes in the long run. So the convergence force is conditional on all that. So a poor country is then predicted to grow rapidly only if these other factors are in reasonably good shape. Otherwise, it doesn't work like that. So let me look at some of these relationships. Okay, so this first figure is thus showing the relationship for about 100 countries between the level of per capita gross domestic product at the beginning of the sample, which happens to be 1960 because of the nature of the data availability. So that's on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is the rate of economic growth over the subsequent 40 years, so from 1960 to 2000. So the main point in this diagram is if you don't condition on anything else, there's no convergence force in the broad cross-country data. Starting out poor or rich does basically nothing for predicting the economic growth rate over 40 years. So in the broad sample, there really was no tendency for the poorer places to catch up to the rich ones. That's true over this period from 1960 to 2000. The second diagram shows the result of a more detailed statistical examination, where in addition to looking at the initial level of per capita gross domestic product on the horizontal axis, and now this is done at various points in time in between 1960 and 2000. But here, this diagram is holding constant a lot of other forces that influence where economies go in the long run. So it's looking at things like the quality of educational and health institutions, about the nature of legal systems, about saving and population growth rates. An array of factors like that are now being held constant. And then in this diagram, you see a strong conditional convergence force that is conditional on all these other variables. It is true that if you start out poorer, which would be toward the left on the horizontal axis, 
has substantial tendency to grow at a higher rate and therefore converge toward the richer places. This is this conditional convergence pattern. So the reason the first two figures look so different is that there's a lot of correlation in the data between where you happen to start in 1960, your per capita gross domestic product, and these other factors that govern how well you're going to do in the long run. So for example, poor places tend to have low quality education and health. They tend to have poorly functioning legal systems. They tend to have high fertility rates. That's why these countries were observed to be poor, in fact, at the beginning of the sample, is that because for a long time previous to the start, previous to 1960, they were not doing things in a favorable direction with respect to growth promotion. So the conditional convergence diagram that you see in this kind of figure that's up currently has good and bad aspects to it. It says if poor countries can get these institutions and policies in good shape, they can grow rapidly and catch up. But on the other hand, that's not the typical pattern. The typical pattern is that poor countries do not get these other factors into good shape, and that's why they didn't grow at a high ra average rate over the period from 1960 to 2000. Now, I want to look specifically at some of these underlying factors that govern where an economy is going in the long run. I think a robust finding in the data is this conditional convergence pattern that shows up in this figure that's currently up. Less robust is the specifics of exactly which other variables tell you where you're going in the long run. That tends to be more sensitive to how a model is specified. But I'm going to try to look here at what do we know as part of that analysis, specifically with respect to education and income inequality. So with respect to education, I'm using the data that Professor John Hua Lee of Korea University and I put together starting uh, more than 10 years ago now to try to measure school attainment in terms of uh, average years. And this is for different age groups, such as over 15 and over 25. The data are assembled by gender, so we have male and female attainment. And we also have different levels of schooling in the various countries. And this is all assembled for over 100 countries for the period from 1960 to 2000 at a five-year interval. Uh, so that's a data set that we began some time ago. And hopefully, John Hua is still updating these data, because uh, I'm afraid if we rely on me to do that, it just won't happen. So let me say some of the major uh, patterns that we observed using these data on, on years of school attainment. If you look at the world as a whole, uh, so most of the countries in the world are included in this data set, uh, the average years of attainment went up from about four and a half in 1960 to almost seven in the year 2000. Uh, those numbers are for the population age 25 and older, but it's a similar pattern if you look at those age 15 and older. So overall, the average years of attainment grew by 50% in the world over a 40-year period. Now, if you look at what's currently the poorest region in the world, which is Sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers advanced from about one and a half in 1960 years of uh, attainment on average for the population to almost four. That is, it grew by a factor of almost three over the 40-year period in that poorest region of the world. You can also use these data to look at what's called the gender ratio. That is, the ratio of female attainment to male attainment uh, on average for populations of different age groups. So that ratio, the gender ratio, which is was typically less than 100 percent, has grown considerably over the 40-year period in most regions of the world.